So I'm assuming that all of you guys are using Gary, right? Who doesn't use Gary? Who doesn't use Gary that doesn't want to use Gary? Okay, it's fine. So we have the right audience, yeah? So the name of our company is Garrett Forge, and as you know, Garrett is highlighted because that's the main focus of what we do. So we are fully dedicated to the development of Garrett Code Review and uh, more specifically to the integration of Garrett with the rest of the DevOps ecosystem. And the reason why this is important because, of course, if you saw all the presentation from this morning, they were all talking about the DevOps pipeline. They were talking about Jenkins, of course, because we are on Jenkins conference. But at the end of the day, if you don't integrate all your DevOps pipeline with your source code, you're completely lost, right? So the source code and the code review is one of the main pillars of the DevOps pipeline. OK, so let's go to Jenkins. So if you go to Jenkins and you want to look for an integration for Garrett, you go to Jenkins.io, you click on plugins, you put Garrett, ta-da, you find a lot of stuff. And then it's very difficult to understand uh, which one you have to choose, yeah? Because actually the very first plugin was called Garrett plugin, was done for Hudson, it's not even listed, right? And then there was um, some other plugins that were created, so We've got Robert Sandal over there, that is the maintainer of the Gary Trigger plugin. Yeah, hello, Robert. And uh, there is the Gary, uh, Gary Verify status report that was written by one of the guys at Gary Forge as well, that is opening the OpenStack project, and many others, one integration with Sonar, Message Injector, that is actually a component for the Gary Trigger, and so on. So the problem is okay, which one should I use? Okay, so the first thing that I looked at, uh, another thing that was really exciting for me was Blue Ocean. And I said, Gary Changes, where are you? Oh my gosh, if I want to integrate Gary Code Review with the Jenkins, and I want to see, I want to use the Jenkins pipelines for my Gary Changes, oh my gosh, where can I find them? I cannot find them anywhere. Because I see the activity, that's fine, I see the branches, I see the pull requests, but there was no space for Gary. Right? And that was really bad because the companies, they haven't decided yet if they want to use Garrett or not, but for sure they're using Jenkins already because this is, I would say, the most uh, used CI system in the world. Then they will say, oh, I can't use Garrett because I don't see Garrett tab in the uh, Blue Ocean pipeline. So I want to do something about that. So. Uh, I will look now at the Gary Trigger plugin and this new plugin because I want to make clear to you what are the reasons why I started to write something different and what are the reasons why the Gary Trigger plugin still makes a lot of sense. Right? So the Gary Trigger plugin has very big bright lights, has been a very successful plugin, has been uh, uh, originally developed by Sony Ericsson, it was Sony Mobile afterwards. And uh, Robert has been maintaining for how many years? Eight. Eight years. But was originally developed by someone else in North Sony I can't remember the name. The guy you yeah, handed over. Oh, okay. It was just the internal one. Yeah. So, eight years, I, I got the date, the number right then. <laughs> So as a lot of installs, so lots of people are using it across the globe, there's a lot of features, really, really many features, because many people started using it, many people started contributing. Uh, some of the people in the company started providing most of the feedback was Ericsson. And Ericsson implemented a lot of new features on top of it. So it's really fully featured. It's really a sweet snack. does a lot of things. And of course, when you do a lot of things, you have a lot of configuration. So the reason why it's so complicated to configure was not because Robert Sandel made it complicated, but because when something is very largely adopted, lots of people are putting their feedback. They say, oh, this feature is, I need this one. And this one, oh, but this one is needed for my company. The other one is needed for my company. And then all of a sudden, everything becomes so complicated, right? And that's normal. Even Jenkins. I remember this morning there was uh, Sasha talking about the Jenkinstein. Jenkinstein is a result of his success, right? Okay, there are some shadows. I didn't say that it's bad. So this is, 
I'm really glad that there is Robert because I really want to get the feedback from everyone, including Robert that is maintaining, to see what are the shadows, how can we improve the plugin as well. So what I see as first shadow is because Jenkins is going to the configuration as code, tools that requires a lot of configuration are going to be really difficult to adopt to the new, this new paradigm. And actually, at the moment, the Jenkins trigger plugin has some kind of open issues on the GEP201, that is the Jenkins configuration as code. Again, if I use the Gary trigger plugin, I don't know how to display them in blue ocean, where are my changes, where am I building them, how to display meaningful information that is integrated with the user experience. Then this is not really the Garrett Trigger plugin fault, but it's really Garrett fault. Garrett for years has been relying on stream events. They're never reliable because SSH was never supposed to do even streaming, it was never supposed to do to be an event bus. And that's why it's really unreliable. So it means that if you're using Garrett Trigger plugin in, in production, sometimes you're missing events. If your node goes down, you go to failover, you need to reconnect. Sometimes the, the stream is completely stuck and you don't, you don't realize why. Your build is not building changes for hours and so on. So if you go to high availability, so you don't have just one master, but you have a multi-master GERD setup, stream events, they don't work anymore because the SSH channel is with one node, right? And that node can go down at any time and you want still the system to work. Okay, so those are the problems that actually I'm going to address into the new plugin. It's not a full replacement of the old plugin, but if you have those problems, you want to sort out those problems, then possibly this plugin is for you. First of all, believe me, you don't have to configure anything. We're gonna see now in practice. So where you fetch the code, this is where you provide the feedback, and that's it, right? It's more limited, I know, but it's simpler. And the last part is because Garrett doesn't support anymore on the stream events, but it's in very big ways now of giving view events. For instance, if you have Kafka, you can get events from Kafka. But if you want to keep it simple, you can just say, oh, that's my HTTP URL. Can you just call me back when something is going on? So you can leverage the Garrett workbooks. So now I talk too much. As my friend Linus was saying, oh, talk is cheap. Let's go to the real thing, right? Let's see the code. So the first good news is that uh, um, now the plugin is available in the plugin central. So if you do, for instance, do Jenkins, um, uh, let's do Linus. Okay, if I do a Java minus jar Jenkins board, this is the typical thing that you know when you install Jenkins for the first time. Okay, I'm going this way because if I show everything as magic, then you will try yourself and you will say, oh my gosh, when I saw from Luca what's working, then I go back and try this even it doesn't work anymore. No, I want to show you something that you can reuse as well if you want to repeat the same experiments by yourself. <laughs> so this will do the standard install, right? If you go to Jenkins.io and you go to plugins, you put Gary here, you will find it here as well, right? So as you can see, the adoption is picking up. We are at 350. Uh, and here you will find in the wiki as well some uh, very interesting uh, documentation on how to use it. Explicitly, there is no documentation on how it is, it is configured because there is no configuration. You just use it. That's it. So with regards to the setup, so imagine that you've got your standard uh, Jenkins setup. You start using it. You just go to the Manage Jenkins, you go to the Plugins, you go to the Available, and you put Garrett Code Review. If you put Garrett Code, it's enough. You will find it, yeah? And the version that I'm going to show you is that 0 0.2, installed without restart, no restart, no daemon starting, no configuration, hence, I guess, yeah, I'm not doing anything, no magic, just works. And once you've done that, you're ready to go. And on localhost local 9090, there is my Garrett instance. There we go. 
see Jenkins, you'll see Gary. This UI is the new UI. So for the people that are using 2.12, you're not familiar with this UI. This UI is entirely redesigned in Polymer and is a lot better than what was used to be in the past. And I've got here a repo that is called Java Hello World. I didn't want to write an application, just took it from the internet. This is the Java official Hello World from Oracle. How hard can it be to get this project configured in Jenkins? So I'm going to create a new job and call it Java Hello World. And because I want to do a multi-branch pipeline, I select multi-branch pipeline. OK? So because before we said that Garrett is actually a Git server as well, so it means I can start building this pipeline by using just a simple Git source, right? Because Garrett serves the Git protocol. And that was really the thinking that I had at the beginning. I say, why should it be different? It should be exactly as configuring Git source. Nothing more, nothing less. Instead of saying Git, I say Garrett. OK, but for Garrett, what should I say more? Nothing. I want to say exactly the same thing that I say to the Git server. So I just put again localhost 9090 Java hello world. I don't want to say anything more. Done. And then if I go there, oh magic, I see changes now. That's a very good start, right? But it hasn't done anything just because there were no changes. Okay, then let's go here, let's go to this project, let's create one change. One thing that is really cool with the new UI, with the old as well, but was just a little bit uh, uh, clunky, is the ability to do the entire workflow with Garrett, even without using the Git command line, if you want. So I can create a, a new change from scratch, right? So destination branch is for master, and, and the change is nice, nice, is beautiful, and warm. Right, that's my first change. There we go. And then I want to start maybe putting some stuff on it. So with the new Garrett GUI, you can just edit your change online, right? And then you can open your files, you open your Jenkins file. There is a new plugin is called Code Mirror that allows you to do inline edit. There are a lot of uh, syntax highlighting there as well. And instead of saying just compile, maybe in Garrett, I want to do some testing as well. Because that's the purpose of uh, having a stable master. I want to do some testing. So instead of just doing compile, I add a test. Instead of just doing Maven compile, I do Maven test. Save, close, and publish. OK? Then I look at this, I refresh. Oh my gosh, nothing happens. Yes, because I'm missing the stream events. Yeah? So how can Gary tell Jenkins that something happened? OK, luckily, I'm in a new version of Gary where I've got a new fantastic webhooks plugin. So I'm executing this script that is just doing a download of the plugin into the plugins directory in Gary. And one thing that is cool about Gary is that all the plugins are self-contained, can be auto-reloaded, and is doing blue-green deployments. So it means you can replace, remove, change, upgrade the plugins with things that are running. And you don't break anything, right? That's cool. But the beauty is that if now I go to the same change and maybe I start a review, and maybe I edit the, the uh, commit message, is, and Sunny. Now, because the, I added the webhook configuration, if I go there and I click refresh, oh my gosh, I can see the changes now. So it means that this plugin, what it's done is to now contact Jenkins to say, listen, whenever something happens, that's the guy you need to talk to, right? And of course, you put more, you can put more than one. And of course, it's resilient. So because Garrett is typically more up to, uh, let's say more, not up to date, but it's more, the uptime is higher typically than Jenkins just because you have a lot more, let's say, high availability on it, it's more likely Gary to be up and running than Jenkins to be up and running. Because maybe you, Jenkins, you use the Jenkins or Kubernetes, you start and stop at different times. Then maybe you got behind a load balancer, so maybe there are a lot of different instances. And then if Gary knows that it was not able to deliver an event, we'll try again and we'll try another one. Yeah, so it's very resilient, this mechanism. 
And then, oh my gosh, I've got my changes, and I've got my test there as well. And uh, guess what? Would it work in blue version? What do you say? But then you see this guy is actually my change. So it's under the tab who requests, but just the wrong name. But it's actually a Gary change. So the changes are there in the right place. So what happens if the build breaks? What I'm expecting Gary to happen? Exactly, I want to verify minus one. And if something is fine, I want to see verify plus one, right? So because this one is, is not configured anywhere, the only place where I can say this is the pipeline itself. And luckily, the pipeline has a fantastic way of saying that. That is, the, in this case, I'm talking about the declarative pipeline. There is a post section that says what to do if things are going well, what to do if things are going wrong. So I can say here, OK, after the stages, let's do a post section. Right? And uh, if everything's fine, success, you need to do Garrett review and give me a score one, right? But and it's failure or failure? Failure? Failure, right? Sorry. You do Garrett review and you do a score minus one. Okay? So this is the only thing that you need to do. So there is a new step that is called Garrett Review altogether. That step is compatible with the scripting and the clarity pipeline that you're supposed to put into the post section. You say what to do, right? Then you save this one, you close it. I haven't changed anything in the configuration of the job. You publish your edit. And then if we go back here, so if we go to activity, you will see that a new build has been triggered already. And then you see that the test is done. And the Gary review label is there. OK, so still doesn't work because I'm missing something, actually. So building is fine even without credentials. But if you want to post a feedback to Garrett, you need to actually use some credentials. So why not using the same credentials you use for cloning the repo? Makes sense, right? So if I was able to clone the repo with some credentials, it will use the same credentials to post the feedback. OK, of course, it's a convention. So if you guys do something very differently, it won't work with this plugin. But if you guys use the kind of normal, typical workflow, that is, use the same credential to go and post the feedback, that will work. So I just go here to my beautiful configuration. I just call it Java here. It's fine. I go configure, and instead of saying that I didn't use any credentials, then I will use the admin credentials. Let me save this one, right? Done it. And then uh, another thing that was always tricky with a Gary Trigger plugin was, OK, now the build is gone, and uh, the feedback to Gary was failing. Now how do I re-trigger a build? So with the Gary Trigger plugin, there are a lot of ways to do it. So you can use a run CI message. You can do some kind of tricks, maybe by doing a rebase. But I say, why the button to do it manually cannot be exactly that one? I want to rebuild that change. I need to go to Jenkins and click this button. I don't want to click another one. I just want to say for the people intuitively, if I want to rebuild a change, I need to go to the change and click rebuild. And it has to work in the same way in this plugin as well. So if I go there, another execution was there. Let's have a look. I like the Blue Ocean view. Let's have a look on the pull request to see if now the step succeeded. Yes, as you can see now, Garrett is giving me the feedback by saying, I've done it and the change has been verified. And if you refresh this page, you will see that I've got a fantastic verified done by administrator. You see, no sweep events configuration, no SSH channel, nothing at all, just works. Because remember, the place where people is looking at the feedback is not Jenkins at the end of the day. Developers like code. They want the feedback in the code. If Jenkins is running something that is finding out that maybe a file is not formatted correctly, the developer wants to see in the code a message that says this file is not formatted correctly. The developer doesn't want go, going back to Jenkins and browsing 3,000 lines of logs and understanding if somewhere in the middle there was some problem. So they want to see the feedback right in the code because they want to be focused on the code. 
So then I started saying, okay, because the first step was, was a lot of fun, why don't we do another step? That is called, instead of just doing Garrett review, we can do a Garrett message. So I want to just, sorry, Garrett comment. I want to post a comment, exactly as I do in the GUI. So imagine that after the test, I want to post a comment by say Garrett comment, and I say I want to comment on the file that is called Jenkins file, and uh, my message on the comment is, well done, Luca. Okay? Just praising myself. Save it and close it and publish. Then of course I don't have to do anything anymore because this one will automatically trigger. There was in the test phase, there was the comment feedback. And actually the comment has been posted, you see? So if I go back to Gary now, and if I refresh here, I will see that some of the messages have been actually posted by Garrett, uh, sorry, by Jenkins. And I can put a lot of information here. So if I go back here, you will see there is a message that has been added as a comment into the review automatically by Jenkins. And that's really important because your pipeline may be really long. and could be not just one pipeline, but a series of pipeline on different nodes. You want to give feedback to the developer as soon as possible. So if you just put the actions on the post, the problem is those actions, they're going to be executed at the end of the pipeline. But imagine that a developer just realizes immediately that, oh my gosh, that change is, needs to do it again because I screwed up the formatting. So if he gets that feedback immediately, he will be able to amend the change and the build that they should have been running for three hours, it will be killed immediately and he publishes a new past and it saves a lot of money. Right? in a lot of time, and the company will be able to deliver faster. So just to recap, this message is going to be added during the execution of the pipeline and can give a lot of meaningful information for the developer. Right? Okay, so there is one more thing that I wanted to show you because this is one of the killer features of the Gary Trigger plugin. Think about that the typical Gary project will have something like 50,000, 60,000, maybe 100,000 refs. And uh, Git itself is struggling sometimes with so many refs. And can you imagine a Jenkins file where the pull request contains 30,000 items? It's going to be a little bit slow to render, to communicate, and it will take ages just to fetch these type of branches. And you can see a little bit of that as well in the output. So if we go here, but if you see to this guy, that is the, let's go to the project again, and multiply log, you see all these refs. So when the Jenkins file is gonna ask Garrett, can you just give me the list of refs you've got? The list is very long. And this is just an example, and it's already filled in one page. Can you imagine in your production project? It will just take ages just to do this phase. And that's why people were using the Gary Trigger plugin, because instead of fetching all the refs, I just have from the trigger the only ref that I need. I'm going to just fetch that one, and it's going to be super fast. And that's right. So I want this one to be super fast as well. A pipeline that takes ages is a pipeline that doesn't work. A pipeline needs to be fast. You need to get a feedback in seconds, not in hours, right? So the problem here then was on the Garrett side. So Garrett is telling Jenkins too much, right? So Garrett is telling changes about many things that will never make sense to be built. Does it make sense to build changes that have been merged? No. Does it make sense to build changes on a very, very old path set? No, because it will never merge them. Does it make change? Uh, does it make sense to make builds of changes that have been abandoned? No. Why do we even tell this to back to Jenkins? Why don't we go in Garrett and we make sure that in Garrett those changes are not even get advertised? Do you guys know how the Git protocol works? Yeah. So the Git protocol has basically two big phases. The first one is called the refs advertisement. So the client doesn't know anything about the server in terms of the server refs, and the server wants to tell the client everything he knows about it. And this part is really chatty. So if you're a Jenkins, imagine that you are on a ephemeral slave, so you've got nothing. You don't have an existing repo that has been checked out. And you do an initial checkout, 
right? You got nothing, and the server will give you everything. It will take ages. So if I go to Garrett now, let me stop Garrett for a second here, yeah? and I enable a new module that is called uh, RAS filter, and let me save this one, and run Garrett again, what happens is that Garrett this time will be able to limit the chattiness of this first phase, of the rest of advertisement. Because the second phase, you just get the objects you want. But the first phase could be really, really slow. And then for the trick to work, I need to disable the anonymous browsing. This is because actually I am back that I haven't figured out in Jenkins yet. If I, if I don't disable the anonymous browsing, the plugin uses always anonymous to do the rest of advertisement. Let me remove this one, anonymous. So let me remove this part. Yeah. So it will just require the people to be authenticated, right? Let's remove this part. So it means you need to have to be authenticated. And save it. Done. So now what I did here, I said that the Jenkins user, let me go to capabilities, this one. So the Jenkins user has a specific permission that said you are allowed to see only the stuff you can build. So basically, whenever you connect to Garrett from a Jenkins user, even if the Garrett contains one million refs, you will only see the stuff that makes sense to you. Then you go here, you go to your multi-branch pipeline, you configure, and instead of saying admin, I say now you're Jenkins. There we go. So look at that. It's not anymore a page. It's just the only change that needs to be built. And he, imagine if I go here and I abandon the change in Garrett, I go there and say, yeah, let's abandon this because I'm going back to London on Friday. It's not going to be nice and warm anymore. There we go. And if I do again here, a scan multi-branch pipeline log, and I go here again, there is almost nothing advertised. So this is a second killer feature. From a user perspective, it doesn't change anything. Right, But when you will try to install this one in production, if you don't enable this, your build will be super slow. If you enable this, it's going to be up to 30 times faster than just using the build protocol. Okay? Well, you should get it back in, in the pretty history of your job. You see a link straight away to the job that links you back to the... Yes. Uh, so the good news is that the, the API, the SCM APIs, include the ability to add that plugin, but I haven't implemented yet. So it's, this is one of the features that I wanted, let's say, to introduce. So using the Jenkins SCM API to populate that information, so it's not going to be in a kind of word links, it's going to be exactly in the place you find for the other version controls. So you're going to have basically the author, who is the owner of the change, What's the headline of the change and the deep link to go to it? So yes, it will be there. It's not there yet. Can you configure this uh, also via the JobDSL plugin? So the question was, can we configure the URL via JobDSL? Yeah, that one you can do it if you want. Yeah, from the JobDSL you can do it even now because you can simply use uh, the Jenkins API and the uh, comment, for instance, to display that information or put it in the logs. You could, in theory. And remember, from the Jenkins file, you can change as well the description. OK, so uh, the question is, you just installed the plugin, but how Garrett knows where it's Jenkins? You should have told Garrett in some way. Yes, but again, it's no clicky clicky. It's again configuration as code. So if you go to Garrett, in Garrett there is a magic, let me go here, local. There is a magic branch that is called REFS Metaconfig. Do you know about REFS Metaconfig? Yeah. So it's a branch that contains metadata. So it's a branch where you don't push code, but you push the uh, configuration of your job, of your project, and tells what the project needs to talk to. So in this case, if I just do git forge origin REFS Metaconfig, uh, sorry, I need to go to the Java Lower project. There we go. Fetch. And I do checkout minus F fetch and you will see that there is the project config, but there is a webhooks config. This one, as it says then, you define all the Jenkins servers you want. Of course, you can define more than one if you want. 
and you define what is the URL needed to call. So the Gary Code Review plugin for Jenkins includes already a webhook receiver that understands the JSON sent by Garrett and just look for the right project to trigger. That's it. And uh, so let's recap. This is not very different from what the Garrett Trigger plugin does, but it's on the other way around. So instead of being Jenkins listening to the events in Garrett, it's Garrett that is responsible for pushing stuff to Jenkins. And these, in the use cases that we've seen with our clients, they typically have one or two, three servers worldwide with Garrett. They've got something like five, 6,000 Jenkins servers. So they say, okay, does it make sense for 6,000 Jenkins servers to hammer my central Garrett? Or Garrett knows when things are happening. So let Garrett just talk to the other Jenkins servers and say, what's going on? So that's the difference. But in terms of the functionality and the payload, the payload that the webhook is sending is exactly the same with the Gary Trigger plugin. There is no difference. The problem with this solution, though, is that uh, we have a central team that manages Gary for us. We have no access to it. So if we have a new Jenkins master, we have to ask them to ask our Jenkins master's language. Very good question. So the question was, OK, but now we are back on the starting point because we need to get ask the Garrett and means to go and configure that. Not exactly, because this is not, you don't have to be a Garrett admin to have permission to write to that branch. So you're in Garrett, you can configure that the project owner, so it needs to be the project admin, not the developer, but the project admin, the project owner can be dedicated to just edit that file. He won't be able to modify the access permissions, but he will be able to modify that file. And you don't need to access the GUI. You can do with the Git protocol, and you can define the delegation in Garrett. So you can allow the people to define this. A second objection was, OK, but this is a mess, because if I got one JK servers and 3,000 projects, I need to configure 3,000 projects by hand. Again, not exactly, because everything in Garrett is hierarchical. So these ones are getting inherited as well. So if you have 3,000 projects, you just put the, all the 3,000 projects underneath the same parent project, you put the webhook at parent project level. So it means that for each one of the child projects, they will be invoked in the same way. And again, if you got some common URLs and you want to override at the child level, you can as well. Okay. But again, this is a separate thing. So the webhook was useful for allowing us to have the triggering real time. Some of the companies, they don't like that. They don't like the fact that Jenkins will trigger immediately. They like to prefer to have a kind of uh, scheduled batch operation doing it. Robert? Okay, so the question is, what are the events that are sent through the webhook? So from this point of view, is really configurable. So you can decide what are the events you want to send. So if you don't do anything like this, is anything, and it will be responsibility of the Jenkins plugin to say, I'm interested in this one, oh, I don't care about that one. But then you'll still generate a lot of network traffic that is not needed. Yeah, exactly. So you can define an extra parameter here. So we'll go through the configuration of the webhook is here. So if you go to browse plugins and go to webhook, let me increase the fonts, webhook configuration. So you can say what are the events you want. If you list events here, the webhook is getting triggered only for those events, but not for all the others. So the webhook becomes a lot, a lot less chatty than uh, uh, let's say the normal situation where you get everything, right? And again, uh, imagine that your Jenkins server is down. That's another objection. So if your Jenkins server is down, what do you do? You're missing events. Because when it's getting back, then the problem is all the events that were been, they have been submitted in Garrett, whilst the Jenkins was down, they're lost. Actually not, because this webhook is very clever. So when you say that you want to send this event to these Jenkins, keeps track of the backlog of events because Garrett has an internal queuing system and uh, retries on a regular basis. This is configurable, how often retrying and how many maximum times. And uh, if he knows that those events were not sent, when Jenkins is back, 
you will send all the past events. So all this logic that previously the Gary Trigger plugin needed to take care of, and that's why it was really big, because they need to do a lot of work, now it's not needed anymore because Gary takes, takes care of it. So the new Gary plugin just focused on the pure integration and leaves everything else to Garrett or to the parts of Jenkins that are responsible for dealing with it, right? Okay, the question was in the Gary Trigger plugin, you could decide which events you want to respond. Uh, can I do the same with this one? Because this one needs to be zero configuration, the answer is no. Otherwise, it will be configuration burden. So I'm explicitly uh, at the beginning trying to, let's say, push back on all the specific features that are really kind of uncommon for this plugin. I believe if you really need those features, this is not an alternative to the Gary Trigger plugin, it's a complement. So it means that if you could do something with a Gary Trigger plugin, it was super nice, and this one doesn't do it, use the other one. Unless there is a very specific reason why this one should do it. Okay, the question was, my, you may want to do different things. Okay, that's a very important difference. So it's not that you want to ignore them, but you may want to do different things. So the feature could be, why cannot I access the entire payload of the event inside my pipeline so that I can do different things? Yeah, that could be a really good feature request. Go to issues.jenkinsci.org, fire your issue, very likely it will be fixed. Or if you want to have fun with the code, develop the issue, we'll be more than happy to review and merge it. Okay, so thank you everyone. I believe it's over for my talk, and uh, I will publish the slides. Slides are already there on SlideShare. I will publish the two videos to YouTube if you want to replay them by yourself. Okay? Thank you, everyone.